Oh boy, well, NXT. Yo, this show felt like it was three hours long. This is what happens when you don't really tell stories in the episode, but instead you just have a bunch of matches, and then you end with a women's talking segment. We just got so much going on here, a lot going on. I'm not in a good mood. I haven't been in a good mood in several days. <laughs> I absolutely have not been in a good mood in several days. I'm not sleeping enough. But um, yeah. three more days left in this week. And then I can sleep, 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 sleep all day Saturday. At least uh, I'll try. But that's Saturday. Uh, the 23rd is today. Today is the day for NXT. So let's get into it. Usually my favorite wrestling show. It was merely, okay. it was merely meh. Not even okay. It was just kind of meh. Braun Breaker and Baron Corbin defeat Axiom and Nathan Fraser. This was a match in which they did a bunch of scary stuff to Braun Breaker, like a top rope Spanish fly, which I said, man, didn't people almost die from this on SmackDown? Why are we doing this with Braun Breaker? How about no, sometimes. We did get a cool spot where Baron Corbin countered a tilt world DDT into the end of days. That was absolutely epic. I enjoyed that. So that was good. Uh, it kind of came together at the end, fast paced, the big guys crushed the little guys as they should during their introduction. Baron Corbin was wearing Braun breakers. Uh, what is that? Like a dog head, like a wolf head thing. It looked silly. It, 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 I chuckled a little bit at it. They're, they're jerks, but they're kind of like, they get along. It was very weird decision making right there. All right. Josh Briggs, he uh, confront Ilya Dragunov, wanted to know where he, Josh Briggs, measures up to Ilya Dragunov. Dragunov is like, look, man, I don't know what you, I don't know if this is a good idea. Briggs says that he's not, he ain't got no fear in him, unlike Ilya, who is scared of Trick Williams. So Trick Williams interrupts this, says that he wants Ilya Dragunov to be 100% for their match at uh, Vengeance Day. So then him and Briggs get into it. Because Briggs thinks that Trick Williams is going to lose to Ilya Dragunov and then go back to being the sidekick of Carmelo Hayes. While, you know, Trick is kind of offended by that and says, hey, you want to see where you measure up? Get in the ring with me. Okay. That's a good deal. So that's uh, the built-up main event. Later on, Trick Williams is conversing with Carmelo Hayes. Carmelo Hayes thinks that Ilya Dragunov is using Trick Williams Said that Ilya Dragunov is the one who attacked him way back in October. He's been manipulating him this whole time. And Trick Williams is saving Ilya Dragunov from an ass whooping that he probably deserves. Uh, Ilya <laughs> said Ilya Dragunov sees Trick Williams as a threat. Why Trick Williams don't seem to get this. He's the hottest in the game right now. And Ilya is trying to evade him. You know, Trick Williams is kind of like, oh, okay, maybe, maybe that's the case. We get to the main event, well, the in-ring main event. Trick Williams defeats Josh Briggs. Um, it was an okay match, I guess. It wasn't awful. Ilya Dragunov was on commentary trying to inspire Trick Williams, trying to talk him up, trying to get him to fight. Um, and then Ilya Dragunov is kicked in the face by Josh Briggs by accident. This led to Ilya Dragunov trying to get into the ring to attack Josh Briggs, and then Carmelo Hayes attacked Ilya Dragunov. They had a scuffle. This was a distraction to Josh Briggs. Josh Briggs then tried to choke slam. Ilya, uh, Trick Williams ended up getting countered into like a victory roll and the one, two, three Trick Williams wins. So it wasn't a dominant win. It was kind of a cheap win, but Trick Williams won after the match. There's a still a lot going on. Josh Briggs attacks Trick Williams, which is a heel turn because Josh Briggs was kind of a baby face going into this match. And Carmelo Hayes and Ilya Dragunov are fighting outside the ring. Uh, the, all the officials and whatever are coming outside the ring, separating them. There's a lot going on. Mello is in the ring with Trick. Uh, Briggs is talking. Uh, Dragunov is barking on the other side. It's just a lot going on. A lot of different pieces doing a lot of stuff. A afterwards, Trick Williams and Carmelo Hayes are arguing again. Trick Williams thinks that Ilya Dragunov is being on the up and up. While Mello thinks that, again, that Trick Williams is being played. That uh, he's dancing to the tune that Ilya Dragunov is, is singing. Uh, this thing has been going on for far too long. This Ilya Dragunov, Carmelo Hayes, Trick Williams thing. This shit's been going on since October. 
this storyline has been dragging ass. You think the bloodline has been dragging ass? This has been dragging ass. We don't even ask questions about this storyline anymore. We just kind of hope the match comes out. Look, I know that uh, Ilya getting injured derailed it a little bit. But Jesus Christ, we should be moving along by now. This thing needs to move. They still have the tag team tournament match next week. So they still have more builds for this. Uh, because Trick Williams and Carmelo Hayes are going to be in that tag team match next week, and then probably going to be in the finals of the Dusty Cup, where Trick Williams is going to have to wrestle twice in one night. I mean, are we ever going to get to the punchline, to the finish line? Are we ever going to get some real development? I mean, Carmelo Hayes is wrestling on SmackDown already. I mean, come, are, are we going to end this thing before he becomes a full-time SmackDown guy or not? Christ's sake, let's get to the bottom of this thing. All right. So, uh, Maddie Ranowski, who is named now is Ren Sinclair, is nervous and anxious like all the other girls in NXT. It's like, there's so many panicky, anxiety-riddled 22-year-olds in NXT all of a sudden. Oh, my God. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Oh, my God. It's like, ugh. And she's just back there fit to bust until Fallon Henley walks over to her, tries to calm her down, tell her, it's not easy being a new girl. Just keep being yourself. Where's Tiffany Stratton, by the way? Where's, where did Tiffany Stratton go? Anyway. Ren Sinclair wrestles Lash Legend, gets slam dunked, which is like the choke slam into the power bomb. Decent, uh, decent finish. It was kind of sloppy. Uh, Ren Sinclair, I know she has an indie history, but let me tell you something. If she was to ever listen to this, that one pant leg gimmick, I don't know who started that, but let me tell you, there's nothing more jobberish than having one pant leg. There is nothing more jobberish. Then one pant leg. It is the worst. All right. It is the worst element that you could do outside of the Andre the Giant strap that uh, some guys are still doing. It's that one pant leg. It is absolutely ridiculous. After the match, Lash Legend was still kind of pissy because this match was all about Ren Sinclair eliminating Lash Legend out of the Battle Royal last week. So Lash Legend felt like even though she choke slammed her and, and pinned her and everything, that wasn't enough. So they were going to jump her when all of a sudden Fallon Henley came out to, to save her. So Ren Sinclair has found a new friend in Fallon Henley. I guess they're really uh, getting together for the women's Dusty Cup. That seems to be where we're going with this. Okie dokie. I don't have a problem with that, I guess. But you would think Fallon Henley would be going up the card. Considering she just beat Tiffany Stratton and made her her servant. She wouldn't be doing tag team stuff. But I, I don't know what they're doing in NXT nowadays, brother. We all popped in unison, all probably about 700,000 of us, when William Regal made his return to NXT TV. But he did so to introduce Ava Rain, I'm sorry, Ava, as the new general manager of NXT. She's the youngest general manager in history. And I, I'm looking like, what is her qualification? She's 22. What is her qualifications to run NXT? <laughs> like, really? What? If you're going to do the general manager gimmick, what, how is she qualified to be a general manager? She wasn't even a qualified wrestler. And she wasn't even a good one. She's not even a good promo. And she's better than she was, but my God. Oh, my word. Unless they're going to directly tie this into her daddy being on the board of directors. There's no real reason why a 22 year old girl is going to be telling like Ilya Dragunov what to do. <laughs> this literally God. ugh. You know, that's that's stupid. This is this is this is a mistake. <laughs> this is a mistake. Oh, no. Um, look, I understand you might not want to put Sean on TV because he, he, he kind of looks kind of funky and wonky right now. Uh, William Regal, he's been done already. You want to have something different. So you want to go with Ava, but you could have had her continue on as Sean's assistant and she's just passing messages and all this kind of stuff. That's a, a good position for a 22 year old girl to be like, an, you know, an assistant to the big boss, an intern, if you will. But she's going to be the general manager. If you don't get the... F anyway. Anyway, she was the uh, host of the final segment of the show. 
which was the contract signing between Lyra Valkyria and Roxanne Perez. Now, a lot of people didn't like this segment, and I didn't think it was that great, but I will say this, and I'm going to give Roxanne per per Perez some credit. She is much better on the microphone here than she has ever been before. When she was a babyface, she was awful, unbearable on the mic. But here, she was actually kind of good. So, they talked about being on parallel paths. Essentially, the day that Roxanne Perez became the champion is the day uh, Lyra Valkyria made her debut in NXT. And ever since then, they've been on this sort of collision course. And Roxanne Perez says that uh, she had to build herself back up after losing or after the title was taken away from her. She never actually lost it. And now she's finally going to get her one-on-one -on -one opportunity. No triple threat matches, no fatal four ways, etc. She says that after she beats Lyra Valkyria, Lyra Valkyria will start questioning herself. You know, um, saying that everything is easy now because the fans love her. But she's going to start questioning herself when she loses. Um, Lyra Valkyria says that uh, she has replaced Roxanne Perez as the top woman in this division. And, she, and uh, at Vengeance Day, she's going to prove it to her. And then she says she always has been physically tougher and mentally tougher than Roxanne. So they start getting in each other's faces when Ava step in and try to get them to sign the contract, which they both do. Uh, both of them uh, turn to leave when Tatum Paxley crawls from under the table. She's been under the table the entire segment. She was under the table. That means that they had their feet under the table. And they did not feel her under the table at all. So she crawls from under the table, attacks Roxanne Perez from behind, and slams her through the table. Lyra Valkyria, who had had a run-in with Tatum Paxley earlier in the day, where she told Tatum Paxley she didn't want anything to do with her because she wants to focus on Roxanne Perez, and she doesn't have time for the hundreds of emails and text messages that Tatum Paxley has been leaving. Well, Tatum Paxley decided to be have a more direct approach, and she slammed Roxanne Perez through that table. Now, of course, the story that they're telling here is that Lyra Valkyria wants to focus on Roxanne Perez, and Tatum Paxley wants to focus to be on her. So she took out Roxanne so that she can get all of Lyra Valkyria's attention. And but but we don't know that we're not supposed to know that yet. But that's what that's what's happening. All right, <laughs> that's what's going on. But we're not supposed to know that yet. Um, Lyra Valkyria was very upset at Tatum Paxley for what she did. And apparently they're going to do something about this next week or whatever. Um, but it was an interesting angle. Having uh, Tatum Paxley hide under the desk was very weird. Because it's like, it's not really believable that she would be hiding under the desk all that time and nobody felt it. Nobody, you know, like nothing. Very odd, but... I will give both of them credit because Lyra Valkyria was better here than she was usually too. So both of them are better promos than they were before. Okay, so OTM attacked the D'Angelo family restaurant, turned over tables, beat up the waiters and stuff. I don't know how that's going to get you a championship match. And that's not how my number one contenders would behave. Um, and they, t <laughs> they told the D'Angelo family that they're, gonna, uh, they're not done with them and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the D'Angelo the family then threatened them. I think the match is going to be at Vengeance Day. They're going to have a six-person tag with Jada Parker being with OTM and The Riz being with the D'Angelo family. I think that's a, a six-person tag. I'm not sure if it's going to be on NXT or uh, Vengeance Day. Uh, I'm thinking it's going to be on TV. I'm thinking it's going to be on TV. All right, so Electra Lopez, she comes into the NXT taping and she's throwing a fit. She's pushing off stuff off a desk. She's looking for Lola Vice. She even goes into the locker room of Ariana Grace, who was in there practicing her speeches and interrupted while looking for Lola Vice. Uh, Ariana Grace is tremendous. She's so good. And you want to know um, her dad uh, did an interview. Her dad is Santino Morella, who says that um, She's good enough to be on the main roster right now, but he wants her to stay in NXT. But the one thing that he's been more happy about is how everybody seems to really enjoy working with her. How, you know, she's a breath of fresh air. She's she's doing really well. She's fitting in, you know, and she has a sense of humor. And he's really proud of that aspect of her career. And I think that is very sweet. 
You know, it's not just I want to see my daughter on like national television. It's that I'm glad my daughter fits in. <laughs> yeah, you know, like I'm glad she's not. You know, she's a little older than everybody else. I think um, Ariana Grace is like 28 or something like that. Most of the people in NXT are not that old. But um, I shouldn't say 28 like it's old, but she's older than a lot of the NILs and all those people who came in. So her fitting in was probably something to really consider because she she's a little bit older than they are. But she's tremendous. She's really good. Uh, Ariana Grace is absolutely a revelation she's so good all right so uh electra lopez is looking for lola vice lola vice is hanging out instead with noam dar now noam dar is in a heated feud with von wagner it's not heated that was a joke it's, there's no heat at all in fact in fact it's built for comedy because von wagner is going to his childhood or high school football field where he's being trained by Robert Stone's sons for the Heritage Cup. So, yes, two twin boys who are look like they're about seven years old apiece is blowing whistles and running around, throwing footballs with Von Wagner, getting him ready for his Heritage Cup match. That's a good way to make that title seem like something. Meanwhile, uh, Noam Dar is hosting Lola Vice on television. He did uh, take a shot at Von Wagner by saying that... Uh, Von Wagner is in the same school, in the same class with Robert Stone's sons, and they share crayons, which I, I thought that was, that was mildly entertaining. Lola Vice comes out, and she's actually, she's acting very hard. She's one of those people that you can just see that she is acting. <laughs> this is just 100% uh, an audition for like an NBC television show. <laughs> this is not like a scene from a wrestling show. So Lola Vice comes out says that there was always an expiration date on her friendship with Electra Lopez. And that Electra Lopez is a leech and she's baggage. Uh, that everybody is jealous of her star power and that she's going to be the women's champion, etc. Electra Lopez questions who uh, Lola Vice even is, says that she pretends to be sweet and hardworking, but in reality, she only got there because she was shaking her ass on Instagram and said that the La Madrina is real. I, I got here through hard work. It is what impressed Santos Escobar. It's what impressed Shawn Michaels, etc. And said that Lola Vice is the biggest phony in NXT. And they're going to have their match next week. But they did have a little bit of a brawl right now on this episode. Uh, this was probably the best Electra Lopez promo she's ever done. Uh, Lola Vice is going. She's going to get it eventually. She's definitely trying to be Meryl Streep. She needs to turn it down. <laughs> like, you can make this stuff sound more natural. But, um, Electra Lopez kicking some real shit that, you know, uh, <laughs> not just that she was shaking ass on Instagram, but she called her, uh, basically a bullshit MMA fighter, too. Which is standard for people who don't like Lola Vice. They basically always called her if she was a garbage MMA fighter or something like that. And all she's about is clout chasing, essentially just wanting to be on TV and all that stuff. So, um, it was, it was, uh, hard blows and safe places when it comes to Lola Vice. This is something that a lot of people have said about her, but I'm pretty sure she's heard it so much that it didn't bother her too much. All right. Dragon Lee defeated scripts during this match. The D'Angelo family attacked, uh, OTM. Uh, Oba Femi was watching this afterwards. He agreed to have a match with Dragon Lee at Vengeance Day. So Dragon Lee is going to be on the card. Yay. He's going to be wrestling Oba Femi. Oh, no. Oh, I like both of these guys. But Oba Femi is going to win. We already know that, right? All right. Chase University is having everything be repossessed. Everything's got to go. There's a liquidation sale. And uh, as they're going through this, and uh, Andre Chase is disheveled. His hair is a mess. Uh, Duke then says that all these things that they're taking, like the flags and the podiums and, you know, they got a football helmet. I'm like, Chase, you got a football team? And we haven't seen any football players on here? Anyway, uh, <laughs> all these are just mere material possessions. You don't really need these things until they take his MVP trophy away from him. And now it's like, oh, God, it's a dismal time for Chase University. And Andre Chase said, well, I guess there's nothing left. 
And Chase U is going to close up shop next week. Now, this upsets, of course, Thea Hale, who is, you know, Chase U alum. And she's very upset about this. Alexis King, who defeated Trey Bearhill earlier in the night, uh, he goes over to console Thea Hale and offer his shoulder to lean on when Riley Osborne comes in and kind of scurries him off. Alexis King, of course, made some threats as he backpedaled, but he did eventually leave. I mean, Riley Osborne is very tiny. Why would you run from that guy? Anyway, Riley Osborne then turned his attention to Thea Hale, who was extremely excited and called called him her hero. And then said, our hero, speaking of herself and J.C. Jane. And then uh, he wanted to talk to her alone. And she was super excited about that. I mean, her spurs was jangling and jangling. You feel me? Ooh, brother. <laughs> anyway, um, J.C. Jane said, you're supposed to be a grown ass woman. You got to you got to chill. You got to act like you've been here before. Um, so this was, this is really good. Um, they, they doing some interesting stuff with this Thea Hale character because, you know, it's a little bipolar in terms of, she still dresses like she's, you know, was going to turn heel on Chase University, but she's still underneath all of that stuff. Still the same Thea Hale she was in the middle of last year, you know, super bubbly, high energy or whatever. She's just dragging JC Jane along with her. And so J.C. Jane has not given up on trying to help Chase U. She said that she still has not unveiled her plan yet. But I guess we'll see uh, what it is uh, eventually. Um, Dijak, he defeated, well, Dijak and Joe Gacy, they didn't have a match. It was a fight that ended up with Dijak kicking Joe Gacy through the wall. Uh, it got a holy shit chant. Everybody was like, oh, brother, what's going on here? And then Joe Gacy laughed and came out of the wall to continue fighting Dijak. Then Dijak chokeslammed him through the announce desk. Uh, Joe Gacy got up again, started laughing, and continued to fight Dijak until the referees and officials, etc., all drug him off this guy. And uh, I, I don't... Man, Joe Gacy has such potential... I don't know what the hell they're doing with this guy now. He had a lot of potential. I really did like Joe Gacy um, when he was doing that um, sort of fake woke character. He's like, he's going to create a cult. And then they took it to, you know, I think a little too supernatural and it lost his legs. But I don't know him. No selling getting put through the wall and then no selling getting put through the table. Joe Gacy's a, you know, a chunky guy, but I don't, I still don't like that. You know, I'm not a fan of that because I don't know where this is going. You know, um, Dijak, did you see his tweet when he was talking about wrestling Okada? Because, yeah, there was this talk about Kazuchika Okada coming to NXT. Look, I, I believe it when I see it. Now, the good reason he would come to NXT, of course, is to get acclimated. He would come in and probably to move to Florida, uh, get his family on over here, uh, get into some uh, English second language courses or whatever. Probably spend a spell in NXT and then go up to the main roster. I could see that happening. But Dijak was basically making comments like, I don't want to hear about Okada unless you hear about me wrestling Okada. I'm like, nobody said that. Nobody wants to watch you wrestle anybody. I want to see you wrestle unemployment. That's what I want to see. I want to see you go one-on-one -on -one with a pink slip. Dijak sucks. He sucks really bad. Who doesn't suck? Idris Enofe and Malik Blade. They're backstage and... Idris Enofe is very disappointed because he made the Dusty Rhodes tights and then he lost. And he said, man, look, I don't know what we got to do to to get out of here, to, to get to the next level. And then the happy bubbly white girl, whose name I can't remember, started coming in and being really extra. Starts trying to expire them, talking about journaling and all other kinds of activity therapy. And it just ends up and Malik Blade are not for it. He said, look, man, we don't, we're not doing that. We're not journaling or doing any of that crap. So then she decided that she was going to, you know, insist that they do some journaling. Five things they liked about the last match they were in, five things they hated. And they say, look, man, we're just so damn desperate to not be jobbers that we're willing to give anything a try. And I like that element. <laughs> We're so desperate to not be bums that uh, we're willing to give journaling a try. 
You know, because we don't we don't want to be bums anymore. So that's good. We don't hope hope these are my guys, man. I hope they don't be bums forever. Blair Davenport defeated Carmen Petrovich. This is another match that was uh, born out of the Battle Royal. Carmen Petrovich. There seems to be something there, but without a storyline, you're not going to get much out of her. Uh, Ridge Holland says that he did not leave the Brawling Brutes to get more partners, so he's going to fight Gallus by himself. He was drinking coffee and looked super normal. I'm talking super normal. I mean, how look, oh my God, he looks so normal. I thought we was going to do like uh, Ridge Holland 316, I, bro I just broke your neck. But no, it's like Ridge Holland, normal guy who reads the newspaper and says hi to his neighbors as a pro wrestler. Like, oh my God, I hate that element of NXT. We're going to make everybody super normal. Like some people are going to be uh, abnormal as fuck, you know, <laughs> and then there's going to be hyper normal people. You know, some people who are just like everyday folk who just happen to wrestle. Like, I don't like that element. You know, it might work for some people here and there, but if everybody like they work in an office, that sucks, you know? And Ridge Holland definitely like he punches a time clock. With, especially with the way he was carrying that coffee cup. I'm like, bro, you punch in at eight, you, you punch in at 7.45. You go to lunch. You take your 30 minutes. You come back in 30 minutes. You punch back. You punch out. You punch back in for lunch. And then you, you finish your day. You get in your Prius. And you drive home. And then you <laughs> take some chicken out of the freezer or something like this. Like, this is not something I would think that this guy is a pro wrestler. Brian Pillman Jr., who is, like, not nearly as big as this guy, looks more like a pro wrestler than Ridge Holland. I'm telling you, bro. I'm okay with the Ridge Holland gimmick of him injuring guys, but he should revel in the fact that he injures guys. You know, him being, like, the uh, the giant who doesn't want to hurt anybody. It's like, why you got all these muscles then if you don't want to hurt nobody? What the, what the hell is the point? You might as well be shaped by John Oliver if you don't want to hurt anybody. <laughs> you know, you might as well just retire. Call it quits. You know, like, you know, what's the point of you going to the gym? You don't want to hurt anybody. But uh, they insist on doing this. But Gallus has run. Uh, they've. I'm done with Gallus, too. I'm done with a lot of the European guys, if we're being honest. I've said that more than once on this channel. NXT was ruined when they dumped all these Europeans on it. So NXT was just aight. It wasn't great. Uh, I would like for it to be fewer matches and more story, um, but they insist on doing more matches. They tell you a lot of story, but there's a lot of matches too, you know, but um, let me know what you guys think and I'll talk to you guys later.